London is a city of change and contrast. The River Thames reflects the brooding centuries of history and the bright swirl of today, of life, of now, of the excitements and pleasures of a great capital. The Tower of London. Splendors and miseries, deaths and fires. Music from royal barges and processions of kings. Norman Tower among the ancient, strong Roman foundations of London. Sometimes you must look upwards for the contrast, and sometimes downwards. In the city, commerce is all jumbled up with heraldry. One minute you're an insurance broker, the next minute you don splendid robes in a dreamlike procession out of the past. Their poses were once to ward off the plague. Inside the classical banks are liveried messengers with top hats, but there are also newfangled devices such as telephones. You are at the heart of commerce, you are also at the heart of history. Sometimes when you look up, the signs denote old commercial houses. Sometimes they denote old ale. The famous and still popular Cheshire cheese haunt of Dr. Johnson is just off Fleet Street, where almost every important newspaper in the world has an office. Fleet Street, the parish pump of Britain. On the majestic steps of St. Paul's, the typists have an hour for lunch. The uh, sparrows and pigeons have lunch all day, fluttering between the steps and the proud dome sailing in the sky, serene above the bustle of commerce. Change is always round the corner. Change to sudden oases of quiet, with names like Amen Court, Paternoster Row, Arbor Maria Lane, Hanging Sword Alley, Bleeding Heart Yard, to a glimpse of book-lined rooms and wide lawns under great trees. Here the lawyers live, thinking. Thinking here in the quiet, loving old gardens and old port. In these quiet gardens, the human tears in the witness box, the furious claims and counterclaims are distilled into precise legal terms. Here is the calm rule of law, but not calm for long. It's all in the papers. Round the corner is Fleet Street again, the street of change, of news, the street where they know everything a day or a month before we do. The uh, mythical griffin guards Temple Bar, the traditional gateway to the city, the boundary between commercial and uh, social life. Piccadilly Circus, the stone village green of London. To take your girl out, to buy a handbag or an enormous limousine, you start from here. From London's most used underground station, you can get anywhere that matters for a few pennies. This is the West End, full of famous and discreet shops that sell fishing tackle or jodhpurs or diamonds. You can browse around in elegant arcades like long drawing rooms, or in Bond Street, one of the world's great shopping streets. Shopping for the newest things, the latest things, or even a nice cabbage if you happen to live here. People still do, although there are no shepherds in Shepherd Market now, any more than there is hay in the hay market.
you're in the mood, you can eat outside. You can change from British roast beef to the food of Italy or Greece or China. You can eat modestly, or you can eat like a Renaissance prince in his palace garden. Great hotels are the visitor's first impression of London after the swift airliner, the carpeted ship. It's where you stop to sleep, to eat, to explore, to live. A few yards from the traffic lies a marvellous great calm of trees. A piece of English countryside at the very centre of our affairs. Tempo changes to the timeless world of children, the world of Peter Pan. Life moves peacefully beside the water. Women, and children, and dogs, and the water. A light, airy painting of summer. That's the great thing about a city. You wouldn't look twice at horse riders in the country, but here they're a spectacle, an entertainment. The whole park is a huge piece of stage country, as though it had been laid out overnight to entertain. In a city of theatres, the open-air theatre is something special. This green plot shall be our stage, this Hawthorne break our towering house but it's the tempest they're doing. All hail, great master, grave sir, hail. I come to answer thy best pleasure, be it to fly, to swim, to dive into the fire, to ride on curled clouds, to thy strong bidding, task Ariel and all his quality. Some of the best pieces of pure theatre in London are free. Her Majesty's horse guards holding up the traffic with their everyday splendour. If you don't know, ask a policeman. If you ask this one, have a lump of sugar ready. London has been here so long that you're not surprised to find whole streets selling nothing but antiques. This one is on the edge of Chelsea. Not only antiques, of course. Here on the fringe of the West End, there's a bit more room. Room for huge shops, which seem to feel instinctively that the residential area is beginning. And they're almost like enormous quiet houses themselves. Great, quiet, carpeted, elegant houses offering all the goods in the world to all the people in the world. The mews and little houses where Victorian coachmen once lived are now smart and expensive. They have coloured doors that say F-I-V-E instead of the figure five. No, I don't think I'll take the role today.
the original big houses are offices or flats. It's the little houses that make Chelsea a smart village now. For Chelsea is a village with homes and children. Military Hospital, the home of the Chelsea pensioners, was designed by Sir Christopher Wren and founded by Charles II. Here these splendid old men, still erect and upright, veterans of long forgotten campaigns, live their ordered lives. In pensioners of the Royal Hospital, in pensioners, chop! In pensioners, boy! Old soldiers never die. Perhaps it's the daily ration of a pint of beer. Turner and Whistler painted in Chelsea too, drawn to draw the ancient river, ever changing, ever the same, running like a noble theme through London, past the Houses of Parliament, past Westminster Abbey, begun eight centuries ago, still filling and emptying with its daily tides of worshippers and visitors. In times of change, some things do not change. Some things give a rock-like strength from the past. This is when London remembers what she is and how she weathered the changing centuries. This is the proud, plumed London of bells and bridges and nursery rhymes. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the Queen. This is the London of palaces, Buckingham Palace, St. James's Palace, where ambassadors present credentials, sentries present arms, and visitors present cameras. At the other end of the Queen's processional front drive is Whitehall, home of the sober-suited civil servants and others more resplendent. Here are the panoply and plumes which thousands pass every day without looking aside. The casual, everyday glory that for other thousands is the most remembered thing in London. Monuments and stone heroes like Nelson, museums and galleries, buildings at the heart of a nation. Ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples lie open onto the fields and to the sky. Wordsworth wrote that on Westminster Bridge in the smaller London of 1802. By the river that remembers Boadicea, the first lady driver with knives on her wheels. But there's always something new on his banks. 
the Royal Festival Hall. From its contemporary balconies, St Paul's comes into view again. The river, once wide and marshy, is disciplined by the stone embankment. The river that is like a man's mind, the part that absorbs and remembers, that sees a change and is alive. Said Dr. Johnson, when a man is tired of London, he's tired of life.